So good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I can see your slides. Right. Okay. Uh, my name is Bayomi, and thank you for the introduction. It's indeed a pleasure to be here. I remember when Victor was giving the overall introduction at the beginning of the session, he said that up until inception, till now, the Amatan School has garnered over 3,000 students. And I thought that was really laudable and incredible. So congratulations to the organizers. Uh, 3,000 students is equivalent to a mini campus, right? So hopefully by next year, we should have the Amatan University, hopefully. So thank you again for inviting me. Uh, the title of my talk today is much more of history and motivation as a uh, support scientific. And I just slightly modified the title to, to give a perspective to what I would like to share, which is uh, the unconventional parts and careers that medical physicians can venture into outside of the clinic, the industry, and the academia. Now, I have some of my mentors here. Um, I also have some of my colleagues and friends as well. Um, so this topic is really not to downplay the essence of medical physics. No, in fact, I'm going to uh, advertise to you, if I could use that word, the reason why you should be a medical physicist. But most importantly, looking at the job markets and the future direction, it is very imperative for us to begin to think outside of the box. Uh, what if you don't get a job in the university? What if you finish your BS or your master's and you don't get that clinical appointment? Are you going to sit at home? Absolutely no. You have to think of what to do with your certificate. And that is the reason why um, I'll be giving this short presentation. So one of my role models and mentor, her name is uh, Dr. Roger Gray. She's an assistant professor of radiation oncology at Dukes. And uh, when she was being interviewed for the Medical Physics 3.0 initiative, she said that medical physicists will always be around but the definition of medical physics will change. And that statement is power packed because uh, whether you have a bachelor or you have a master's or you have a PhD, um, irrespective of the graduate programs that you've been to, you would always be a medical physicist. But if you dial back to 50 years ago, the work that a medical physicist is engaged in is quite different from the work that a medical physicist is engaged in in 2024. And 20 years from now, oh, I mean, the definition of medical physics would have definitely changed. So looking at the future, um, how should we as students, uh, graduate students, uh, colleagues, uh, prepare for what is coming ahead of us? And one of the questions that I often ask myself, because I'm actually in cancer research, uh, if one day we have a breakthrough and cancer gets killed, will the field of radiation oncology and medical physics still be relevant? Because these two fields are very hinged, right, on treating cancer. But what if there's a scientific breakthrough and we have a potent drug for cancer and no one ever has a cancer again or cancer could be eradicated like HIV, would we still have our jobs as religion oncologists and medical physicists? And these are some of the questions that I would like to pose to you as students, as professionals, in thinking about expanding our port frontiers and chakering unconventional parts as a medical physicist. So Dr. Sandwell effectively spoke about what is medical physics, which is just the fusion of the branch of physics and medicine. Um, basically, it's just using physics principles and concepts to solve problems um, in medicine, while bioengineering or biomedical engineering is just using engineering principles to solve um, medical problems. Uh, I myself, I actually consider myself as a multidisciplinary scientist. Um, I have a bachelor's in physics electronics, and I went to Unilag to study medical physics. And I came to Japan and completed a PhD in biomedical engineering. I did a certification in radiation biology. So it's like I'm just switching in between all of these uh, multi-nucleated field. But the nucleus of or the goal of the program is to be able to contribute effectively to patient care. And so whether you're a biomedical engineer, you're a nuclear physicist, you are a health physicist, you are a science communicator, you're a medical physicist, the goal really is centered around patient care. 
So basically you're using your knowledge to solve medical problems. So in the knowledge, you could definitely take a lot of physics tools uh, to solve medical problems. I'm just going to flip over that because that has been well talked about. And one of the beauty about medical physics really, before I start to talk about the unconventional part is that, um, I think Dr. Sandu well spoke about it. We are the only profession in the clinic that we can be able to visualize the chain of treatments, okay, right from the beginning to the very end when a patient enters the hospital. And we are also, I believe, without any prejudice, the only profession in the clinic that can spread and proliferate into several hands, right, of the clinical departments, you know, in oncology, so physiotherapy, even to urology for the treatment of uh, through plastic hyperplasia, um, even to cardiology for developing, you know, has vast and incredible um, uh, uh, biological components or organelles, even for uh, developing brain implants and even for retinal corrections in ophthalmology and lots more. So the, uh, the, the, the field of medical physics is really extensive and is always evolving as new technologies are being developed. And I would like to talk about the history briefly, just to tell you where we're actually coming from, in order to give you an holistic view of where we're actually going and what you should begin to do now as a student if you really want to fit effectively into the future of medical physics. But looking back into history, um, I love history a lot. The, in 1501 BC, I mean, that was like the very first medical documents that was ever written uh, by Edwin Smith. He was a surgeon. And in the documents, the document was actually written in Egypt, it's in Africa. So <laughs> we all should be proud of the very first medical documents in our, from rising from the African continent. And it's the oldest medical documents in the world, like I said. And in that document, uh, Edwin Smith has actually described the treatments of breast abscesses uh, by cauterization with the fire drill. And that was the very uh, first impression of using fire, electricity, right, to treat diseases. But moving up on to 460 BZ, uh, Docratus, who is a Greek physician, is actually regarded as the father of modern medicine. He actually used, um, recorded the use of temperature uh, for how to measure you know, body changes. And even up until 200 AD, um, another Greek philosopher, in fact, in this particular picture, these particular cemetery priests, they were using some sort of magnetic prints for the treatment of arthritis. Back then it was maybe known as, you know, voodoo, African voodoo or something, but now we know that there's a scientific correlation, right, between magnetic force influences, you know, the treatment of arthritis. Um, and even up until 965 um, to 1039 uh, BC, um, an Iraqi polymath is an incredible scientist who was gave the first impression right, of the experiment that has to do with the physics of vision. And you know, switching back to 1452, Leonardo da Vinci, whom we all know, is actually discussed as the father of medical physics. He's the first medical physicist because he was the very first person that detailed the study of the human body mechanically and biologically. And um, in the 17th century, the field of mechanobiology begins to sort of gain prominence, right? And it's morphed into a field called hydrophysics. But because of the challenges involved in understanding how classical physics could bring about some fundamental questions, the field of hydrophysics didn't gain much of relevance because it lacked uh, you know, conventional practice. Um, it was also at that time that classical physics was actually morphing into quantum physics or modern physics. So hydrophysics then morphed or transitioned into medical physics. So medical physics actually gained prominence, you know, starting from the 17th century. And of course, flipping over back um, into 1895, uh, we all know the discovery of the X-ray by William Courant Rogin. As a matter of fact, some people have actually speculated that maybe this was, you know, Rogin's wife. Some people have said, no, it's the secretary. But what we know was that one day Rogin uh, was working. He had uh, maybe his wife now speculatively had a ring and the hand was placed on the photographic plate and it beamed this X-ray and boom, you could actually see the radiograph and the capillaries, I mean, and the metacarpals, pardon me, of, of the human finger. And this was really incredible. It gave us the insight that, oh, radiation could actually prove the human anatomy, right, at the cellular level. And up until 1896, when Mercury and Mercury 
you know, discovered the principles of radioactivity, um, even up until 1902, when just radiation detection now moved into radiation biology. This was the very first time that scientists knew that radiation is very deleterious. It could not only detect human anatomy, but it could also cause a lot of biological damage. This was actually a uh, Bequere and his um, assistants who they placed the radium source. And a few minutes after the radium source, they were able to see some sort of you know, biological damage or the skin tissue, also known as erythema. And this uh, science or this uh, situation okay, developed the field of radiation biology, which is my own personal focus. And of course, in 1912, uh, the field of radiation protection, because now we have radiation detection, radiation biology, now people now begin to say, okay, radiation is very deleterious. We have to form a society, we have to have a regulation uh, around radiation, the safe use of ionizing radiation. And the very first invention, right? So medical physics was actually uh, added in 1913 when engineering concepts now begin to morph or move into medical physics application. And that was at the discovery right, of the X-ray tube by William College. And of course, to after that, even in the 1940s and 1950s, we had you know, the invent of the uh, complete exact tomography by Gosfried, Onfried, and um, Alan Macquer, Tomac. We had the MRI, we had the PET, we had even the real-time tumor tracking system here in Hokkaido University in Japan. We have the adaptive film therapy. We have just incredible, incredible um, uh, inventions of technologies for advancing patient care. So I said all of that to say that medical physics has come a long way. So currently now, the field of medical physics is divocated into three main you know, segments or three main areas of, of, of pursuits. One is the education, the academic education. The second really is research, and the third is the clinical. And uh, at the intersection of the research and the clinical is actually the industry, right? And we have incredible uh, personnel in Nigeria who, are, who have pioneered medical physics education. Um, I can actually see Professor Balogun in the chat. We have Professor Aweda. We have incredible physicists, uh, clinical physicists. Uh, my MSc advisor, I can actually see him as well. Dr. We have incredible researchers as well. And we have people also in the industry as well. So this is currently the um, area of focus for medical physics that you can actually venture into after your degree. So um, in research, uh, you could do different lot of things, you know, develop new innovations and medical devices from design to quality assurance to the fusion of machine learning algorithms, you want to validation of those techniques like uh, Mrs. Oshunami was speaking about, right? We are medical physicists start to validate, you know, the uh, products that our medical engineers have actually developed. And even into um, education, you know, we have fundamental knowledge, you know, uh, Dr. Peter spoke about this, continuous learning. There are different continuous learning platforms. I actually think from my experience that if I had all of the knowledge I had now, I mean, it's actually when I'm in university that I will have taking advantage all of the of all of the incredible platforms of continuous learning resources that we have, you know, from Coursera to the MIT courseworks to YouTube itself, you know, so just incredible uh, platforms that we have. So uh, just go on the internet is an incredible resource that you could always learn one or two things from. Okay, if you really want to improve your art skills, right, in medical physics, then graduate programs, we have the BSc, the MSc, a PhD, the different certifications. And now let me also say something very critical here. I could see from the questions in the chat, some people are saying, okay, you know, I'm from health physics, I'm from biophysics. Uh, how do I move into medical physics? I'm studying biomedical engineering. How, how do I move into medical physics? I understand the quandary because in Africa, it seems that we focus more on nomenclature. But from my experience, medical physics and um, medical engineering and health physics and biophysics, there is a lot of intersection and multidisciplinary inflow in between all of this field. The nucleus is patient care and health care, right? So whether you are in nuclear physics and you are interested in medical physics, you just have to think of how to apply all of the things you've learned, right, to solve a medical problem. So whether you're a biomedical engineer or this. So what I would say is that 
if you're currently maybe enrolled in a program like, say, the University of Biden, you're studying uh, MSc radiation and health physics, don't feel the tech that you're studying health and radiation physics. No, in fact, you should make an impact with that because you have a knowledge that nobody else has. If you're saying you're in Cardinal University, you're studying just biophysics, don't feel like, oh, I'm not doing medical physics. No, if you feel like, oh, I'm doing biomedical engineering, I'm not doing medical. No, see, the issue is that whatever you are, it's a bed in hand. And you can use that to make an impact, irrespective of the graduate program that you are currently in. I really love the story of the first speaker. We actually transitioned from BSc physics, you know, into theoretical physics, you know, into doing biophysics and now in medical physics. So you just have to look for where your passion lies and transition accordingly. Then, of course, too, you could also do a lot of internship as well. And of course, in the clinic, um, we have a lot of um, establishments, implementations, um, supervisions of radiation protection instruments, which is dose monitoring, optimization, quality assurance, treatment planning, which is like the major bulk of the work for radiotherapy physicists anyway. So the question I really want to ask is, so what is the medical physicists of the future? And what are some of the strategic places that we as a student, as a professional, you can begin to think about, right? But before I show you, uh, one of my incredible role models, I've never met him, his name is Michio Kako. He's a professor of theoretical and string physics at uh, the City College, uh, College in New York. And I was being interviewed about, will AI take our jobs? And do you know what he said? He said there are three jobs that AI, okay, would never replace. And I'm going to play the video for you. Well, there are three kinds of jobs that robots have a hard time replacing. The first is blue collar jobs that are non-repetitive. Robots cannot hammer a nail. They cannot pick up garbage. They cannot fix a toilet. Robots are very, very bad at non-repetitive blue collar work. Second, emotional jobs. Jobs involving rapport with a human being, being a professor, being a teacher, uh, being a counselor, being a, uh, a therapist, all that cannot be replaced by a robot. Third category is imagination. Mm -hmm. People that are innovative, that are leaders of society, that strategize, that dream about the future, those jobs cannot be replaced. So as long as you fit into one of these three categories, chances are you'll have a job for a long time. So, this so maybe this is my time to play the quiz. So do you know which of the categories that the medical physicists can fit into? Uh, a blue collar job, an emotional job, or an imaginative job. Do you want to put it in the chat? At the end of uh, this session, you can let me know what you think. But you see, medical physics is an incredible field. Uh, it could be blue collar or green collar. It could be extremely emotional. Um, it could also be extremely innovative, right? We are the forefront of medical frontier. So I believe that medical physics, uh, like Dr. Rudy Gray said, would always be around, but the definition would always change. So how did you prepare yourself? Um, there's a report, a communique that was published by the Australian College of Physical Scientists and Engineers of Medicine. And they were actually talking about how to reinvent yourself as a medical physicist. But this is more applicable to medical physicists, but I'm going to extract it to bring it to a very layman level, okay, to the level of um, a student or an undergraduate or postgraduate student. Now, medical physics is ever evolving, right? I already told you, I mean, the first mention of medical physics was in uh, 19, uh, in the 14th century, right? When Edwin Smith treated uh, abscesses with, uh, with fire. And of course that has evolved, you know, up until 2024. But you see this statement said that the boundaries between medical physics specialties are going to be blurred significantly. Now, Currently now, uh, we actually have uh, the PET MRI system, right? Uh, this is basically using imaging guidance, you know, for radiation therapy. We have the Linux CT imaging modality. This is basically using image guidance for, you know, providing efficient accuracy during radiation therapy. So basically in the future, you know, all of these medical physics specialties would be interwoven that one person will be able to effectively, you know, multitask into the other field. And that should begin to teach us, you know, as students or as professionals that we should continuously update ourselves. We should not just say, oh, I'm in clinical radiotherapy physics, I'm in medical imaging physics, I'm in nuclear medicine, I'm a biologist. No, all of these fields, we definitely have one or two ways to interact with, again, okay, in the future. 
and they are going to be blurred very much significantly. So you should have at least a bit of knowledge here and here so that you can effectively play your role, right, as a scientist or a medical physicist. Now, in the second community reports, they said that almost all of our work involves exposing patients to ionizing radiation. But in the long term, the truth is that the imaging modalities that are being developed now will rely less on exposure to ionizing radiation. Even now, we have incredible uh, three-dimensional human proportions algorithm that uses computer vision for scanning you know, the human body. We have it on an iPhones, the iPads, you know, and all of that. So these are technologies that are being developed that are relying less more on ionizing radiation. And the medical physics work is just more about using ionizing radiation for diagnosis, prognosis, treatments, and prevention of diseases, right? So if, if you can find a way to develop our technological skills, to develop our programming skills, to develop our technological achievement, uh, right among your students, that would enable us and place us in a very competitive part of the world in how medical physics is actually evolving. The third part of the communique, you know, says that machines are not getting smart. Machines are now getting smarter. Now we can actually see that with the reinvention of charge GPT, right? And may not need as much routine intervention from us in the future. So medical physicists, so whether you're not a professional or whether you're still a student, will actually engage more in more of clinical workflow. And I think Dr. Sandra made mention of this. We are the only profession in the clinic without any prejudice that have the ability to see from the end to the beginning the entire chain of treatments for any patient. So we'll be able to apply our emotional skill, you know, a very soft skill, a system thinking skill, like you actually said, you know, to enable effective work workflow right in, in the clinic. And of course, too, this is 2024, right? By 2044, most of us, you know, will be maybe old, in our 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and maybe up on eternity, or maybe in after we are gone. But the world of medical physics would be different in 20 years' time. I mean, there's an infusion of machine learning algorithm. Oof, that is like, you know, incredible, right? There's a lot of things that we can actually do, you know, just by sitting at our desk, sitting in the dry lab, instead of a wet lab, trying to gather a lot of incredible data sets. And it is actually when you are a student now, that you have the ability to learn. Um, just from the first speaker was saying that when she was in, um, am I correct? Uh, that you had to go to my time, I, I, I was listening arbitrarily to go yeah. and learn about uh, machine learning um, um, events or something like that. And those uh, things that you learn propel you for the future. So currently now is the time if you have not been involved in programming or just learning how to simple codes or learning how to use um, computer algorithms for solving medical problems. This is actually the time that you have. Uh, the, 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 you actually have a lot of time at your disposal. You, I mean, with respect, some, maybe some people might be funding themselves, I understand. But this is the time you have. You don't have children, you don't have, uh, I mean, you, you just have yourself to study. So. I would encourage that you use the time you have now to learn as much as possible because the field is going to definitely change in the, in, in the, in the coming years. And uh, I've already said this before. By the way, let me just say, before I move into the very final session, that medical physics is not using AI will definitely become expendable in the future. And that is not only to medical physicists, it's also to almost all other aspects of scientific research. So now to the point of my discussion today, if you don't get a job as a medical physicist in the clinic or in the hospital or maybe in a research center or in the industry, what else can you do with your degree? But before I tell you what else can you do with your degree, let me tell you the reason why you need to begin to think of unconventional parts. Number one is that you can have and build diverse skill sets, right? For example, I told you my own story. I have a solid skill in design and electronics, in medical physics, in bioengineering, in molecular biology, in cellular biology, in radiation biology, and in machine learning. And all of these things are because of the parts that I've taken, and it enables me to have a multiplicity of skill sets that, that I can actually use okay, for my future. And of course, so you have the opportunity for adaptability and flexibility. Uh, Dr. Sandra was saying something about giving credits to his center or giving him the opportunity to come give a lecture. And that is because maybe he has a lot of values to provide the center and that and in just in return they gave him 
you know, flexibility to teach, to do all of these things. So when you have um, a lot of skills, it gives you a lot of you know, flexibility to get involved in a lot of things. Of course, too, one of the advantages of thinking about unconventional parts is that you have the ability, you know, to, to innovate. I was speaking to one of my friends, she's Japanese, and uh, whenever they want to scan, uh, maybe dry their hair, it takes longer time. And she was complaining to me, so I said, look, at, we can actually develop a technology where by you can scan your or dry your hair in less than a fraction of a second, but that would not be the only thing. We can actually use that, you know, as 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 a yes scanning system to detect scans of the hair, you know, to detect, you know, various locais, you know, for seeing, you know, just for hair improvement generally. And that's because of my physics and biology knowledge. So you can be able to develop a lot of innovative strategic innovations, okay, when you when you have just a multiplicity of skills. And of course, you can also build your professional growth, right? You can also meet a lot of industry demands, even not in Africa, you know, all over the world. You have a lot of entrepreneurship opportunities. I believe that a government is not a sole employer of labor, right? It is actually entrepreneurship opportunities, small scale businesses. When you have an idea, okay, and you have the money to fund the idea, you can be able to push your entrepreneurship of um, um, idea, right, into limelight. And of course, you expose a lot of global opportunities. I was speaking to a friend of mine in, um, here in Japan, he's actually Ghanaian, and we were talking about just the amount of incredible opportunities you have, you know. Um, as, as a medical physicist out there in the world, people are actually waiting for you. So whether you're in science, whether you are in health physics or anything, you have a lot of global opportunities if you, you know, make an impact of yourself. And most importantly as well, you can make a lot of money, right? I was watching a video recently. It's about a guy who moved from quantum physics now into the uh, into Wall Street, you know, into economics. And they were asking him, why did you actually move, you know, from engineering or physics into economics? He said, okay, it's because I can actually make a lot of money, right? So you have increased job satisfaction. You can pay for your bills. You can, you know, treat your parents nicely. You can buy a lot of incredible things you want to buy. So it's and it's because you have, you know, diverse skills. You know, it's people call it the multiple streams of income that can be able to pay and give you a lot of increased job satisfaction. And of course, you can build an incredible, unique professional identity, right? I mean, without. Um, well, maybe I shouldn't say that, but I believe that uh, when you have a lot of multidisciplinary skills, it just makes you incredibly unique. I mean, everybody will be looking for you. Everybody will want your insights. Everybody will want, you know, your value. And that is because of the things that you've built. So do not just limit yourself to one area of science. Try as much as possible to learn one or two things and combine them together. As a matter of fact, I was listening to one of the Nobel laureate in immunology, uh, Professor Kamegawa from Japan. And he was being asked, how can you develop a creative idea? Do you know what he said? He said, you can only develop a creative idea when you blend ideas, when you blend innovations from fields where people do not normally interact. So you have medicine, engineering, economics, biology, chemistry, when you can actually have a lot of skills and you blend them together, you create an incredible unique identity. And that is actually what you can do as, as a student. And most importantly, the goal of science is to make significant contributions to the field. So ladies and gentlemen, what are the pathways that you can chart out outside of medical physics? I have curated a lot. You can become a strategic innovator. You can become a data scientist. You can become a radiation safety officer. You can become an healthcare technology. You can become a biomedical engineer, a regulatory scientist. A clinical researcher, medical imaging blogger, which I am, a telemedicine specialist, a science communicator, we're actually lacking in this regard, you know. And most importantly, ooh, space science. I love this a lot. I mean, you know, there's a lot of programs right, right now in the world uh, trying to, even right now, I was discussing with a, a mentor and a colleague here, a Dr. Yogo, about the Nigerian Space Agency trying to recruit for astronauts. And this is because of the interest, right, in deep space exploration. And the only science, okay, um, currently right now that has incredible deep understanding of the uh, biological effect of radiation of the human body is medical physics, right? So as a medical physicist, you have to be a potential astronaut, a potential space scientist, you know, you're a potential bioinformatist, you're an incredible scientific programmer, you're a multidisciplinary scientist, you can be at the forefront right, of political innovation, becoming an healthcare analyst, trying to make demands from the government on treating us better as incredible scientists. So you can, you know, go into all of these things just in case, you know, you do not want to become a conventional medical physicist. But the goal, like I said, the nucleus is patient-led. 
nuclear, the nucleus is trying to make precision, is trying to develop precise um, and, and, and accurate uh, therapeutic strategies for, for, for patient care. I'm going to leave you with this very short video. It's an incredible video of um, someone whom I, whom I really admire. A lot of people in the US already know him. And he's one person that defined all odds and showed us that as medical physicists, we can actually become whatever we want to be. It's a few minutes, sorry, a few seconds long, so please be patient and this session will end. He has a PhD in astrophysics from MIT and is a board certified medical physicist. He completed his residency at Harvard Medical School and then joined the faculty as a clinical physicist and researcher where he helped to treat cancer patients with radiation therapy. He's a private pilot and an Eagle Scout. Chris Williams. So I stopped the video and Chris Williams is currently on the Artemis launch crew right now into this space um, and of course maybe into Mars in the future. And from what I read about him, he would be maybe the first medical physicist to be in the space, right? Contributing incredible research, right, to the NASA program. And that is to tell us that medical physics will always be around for the definition of medical physics will change. So if you're a student right now, whatever you're doing, you can be incredible, you can be impactful, but just try to just possible to think of the future and combine all of the things you're learning to create incredible impacts. So thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Abayomi uh, I know that if we leave you, you'll give us like a one-hour lecture. And surprisingly,